So today's presentation, Bite Back and Reclaim Your Yard for Mosquitoes. I know that mosquitoes are not an insect that you think about until the rainy season when they become this major headache for most people, but they are the number one deadliest insect in the world when it comes to spreading disease and death among humans. So I'm happy to know that you are being proactive in trying to protect yourself from these insidious little insects by sitting through this presentation today. So thanks for joining me. So an overview, um, what we're going to talk about first is a little bit about mosquito information. We'll go through some mosquito vector diseases, their life cycle, um, uh, steps to limiting those mosquitoes in your yard, how to protect yourself and others from, from the bites, and what works and what doesn't. So to start with, um, according to HUI, the World Health Organization, worldwide mosquitoes kill more than 700,000 people each year through these vector-borne diseases. Just to give you a few examples, malaria is a parasitic infection that's transmitted by Anopheles mosquito. It causes over 219 million cases globally with more than 400,000 deaths every year. And most of those deaths occur in children that are under the age of five. Dengue is a viral infection that is transmitted by the, the Aedes mosquito also. Um, it causes 40,000 deaths per year, as well as an estimated about 96 million symptomatic cases each year. So it's important to realize that if you end up with one of these diseases from a mosquito bite, you, you may not die, but you can have some long lasting, uh, you know, major negative effects when it comes to your health. So in Florida in 2020, there were no reported cases of human deaths, but there were reported cases of dengue fever and West Nile virus. Um, these are the top two mosquito vector diseases in Florida, but we also deal with the encephalitis, with Zika, with chikungunya and malaria. So given these types of statistics, it's important to take the threat of mosquitoes seriously. And in Florida, we certainly don't have any shortage of mosquitoes, even with our mosquito management services working hard to keep those numbers in check. So this is just a statistic from the CDC on the number of human deaths, and, it, and this is from 2018, um, from living organisms. So it can be either a shark or a disease transmitted by a mosquito. As you see, one of the tiniest organisms, right, the mosquito, is much more deadly than a shark in, in the ocean or getting killed through a snake bite or a dog attack. So um, I, I am glad you're here today to figure out how to get rid of these things. Um, this is just a graph from the Florida Department of Health. It's the arborvirus monitoring results that are so far from 2021 for the entire state of Florida. I wanted to put this up just to emphasize that mosquito control is extremely important and the state takes this job very seriously. Monitoring happens year round and each county uh, mosquito management service is on high alert as we enter our rainy season. So these are really interesting reports and anyone can access them through the Florida Health website. And I have that down here, but if you just go to the Florida Department of Health, you can find these uh, surveillance records and pull them up. So there are about 3,000 species of mosquitoes worldwide, and over 200 of them are found here in, in the United States. But here in Florida, we have about half of those uh, mosquito species that are found within the US. So we have 80 species that are here in Florida. And of those 80, 33 of them cause problems for either uh, for us or for our domestic animals. So of those 33, 13 of those species are called container mosquitoes, and they're capable of transmitting the pathogens that cause um, disease in us and in our animals, both our domestic and our wild animals. So UF has the Florida, Entomo and Florida Medical Entomology Lab in Vero Beach, and it's created some really good uh, resources on container mosquitoes. I have links to that information at the end of this, this presentation, so you don't have to go hunt for it. But Although mosquitoes are native to Florida, we are the number one cause of mosquito pest issues through our behaviors. So these container mosquitoes would not exist um, in and around our home if it wasn't for our behaviors. So um, you will understand that, that statement as we go through this presentation and learn more about the behaviors of container mosquitoes. So I know I keep saying container mosquitoes because Container mosquitoes are the, the ones that give us the problems and the ones we're gonna be talking about today. 
So um, how do mosquitoes uh, differ? So um, one, they take in different types of blood meals. So some prefer one specific host, while others just want a warm blood meal, right? Whether it's from an animal, a human, or uh, mammals in general, they really don't care. They just want some blood. They're egg-laying sites. Today, we are strictly talking about container mosquitoes, which are also called floodwater mosquitoes, but they are just one type of, of a mosquito. Um, another one that we have here in Florida are marsh mosquitoes, and those are, are permanent water mosquitoes. So their, their behavior and their biology is different. So the time of the day they fly. So this is quite variable. There are mosquitoes that fly right around dusk and dawn, others that are active like during the day when we are out, and then mosquitoes that fly only in the, the witching hour, right? That, that midnight and after hour. So those are, those are even a different type. Temperatures. Um, most mosquitoes do need to be, um, the temperature needs to be up above 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for them to be able to be active and to be functional. And then seasonality. Some are found year round, while others are more concentrated uh, just during the rainy season. So mosquito-borne diseases. So this shows you the, disease, the diseases that are vectored or carried by, that, for, by mosquitoes that can infect uh, people and or animals. So with West Nile virus, dengue fever, and chikungunya being the most common in Florida, there are others, um, and there are others, although they have been found in Florida at one point or another. So um, malaria, yellow fever, and filariasis have been found here, um, but that West Nile, dengue, and chikungunya are the most common. When we say that mosquitoes take the top spot as the deadliest animal in the world, it's because they vector a whole host of deadly diseases to us and to our animals. So the encephalitis can occur in people, but they can be fatal to unvaccinated horses. So triple E, so that's the Eastern equine encephalitis is the most common here in Florida and can cause severe disease in humans, um, horses as well as in dogs. So a few more statistics, um, according to the CDC, in 2018, the number of severe cases of West Nile virus in the U.S. increased by 25% compared to our previous decade. And then in 2017, nearly half a million people died of malaria and millions more became ill from this disease. So, and the fact that Florida has historically had extremely low deaths due to mosquito vector diseases, we should all be very happy that our, our respective mosquito management services take their job seriously for being vigilant about controlling these insects. So which mosquito to blame? So mosquitoes can vector different types of transmissions. Um, these vector-borne diseases can be caused by either parasites, by bacterias, or by viruses. Many of the mosquitoes that are problems for humans are, are vectors are arboviruses. That just means they're a virus carried by an arthropod, right? So arbor is arthropod. And these are Zika, dengue, chikungunya, and yellow fever, which are all vectored by the Aedes uh, species of mosquito. So as you see here, you're, you're gonna see this in color. So this is just, to, the colors are to show you which species uh, will vector those diseases. So another arbor virus is West Nile virus, which is vectored by the Culex species. Um, yellow fever infects um, humans and some small mammals. It has a 30 to 70% mortality rate and there is no cure. Um, of those that do survive, 15% develop some really serious illnesses that can you know, be organ failure, bleeding, shock, and it can eventually lead to death. West Nile virus um, primarily affects birds, but it can also affect bats and horses, um, small mammals, alligators, and, and people. It is the leading cause of mosquito-borne disease in the U.S. and was discovered in Florida just in, in 1999. So it's a fairly recent uh, disease that's been, been discovered here. Um, there have been about 400, a little over 400, so 404 recorded cases since then, and there are no vaccines for people. Many people are asymptomatic, but um, one out of 150 will develop some really serious sim symptoms or conditions. And then um, one disease that's called, caused by a protozoan, which is a parasite, is malaria. So malaria affects people and primates, but birds, bats, and, and lizards are also hosts. There are about 2,000 malaria cases annually in the U.S. 
And in 2003, there were eight cases found here in Florida in Palm Beach, but draining larval habitats um, using larvicides and adulticides, as well as uh, things like the anti-malarial drugs have made it an extremely rare disease here in Florida. And thank goodness for that. <laughs> so for the um, encephalitises, Encephalitis are zoonotic diseases, which are infectious diseases caused by a pathogen that jumps from a non-human animal to a human. So triple E, so that equine encephalitis, Eastern equine encephalitis is the most common here in Florida. That disease uses a bird mosquito transmission to carry the virus. So what happens is that virus builds up quickly in birds. And when another mosquito bites that bird, it gets loaded with that pathogen. So when, when that mosquito then bites a human or a horse, um, we get sick, but due to the size of our bodies, it can't build up enough virus in the body to transmit that, um, that through successive mosquito bites. So, um, you know, it same goes for, for horses. So, so we're big bodied animals. And so we're called dead end hosts, right? We can get sick from it, but we can't transmit it because it just can't build up in our body enough. So dog heartworm, I'm going to talk about this for a second, because as you can see, dog heartworm with this, which it's a parasitic nematode is carried by multiple species of mosquitoes. It's an awful disease. Um, it's very painful and debilitating in, uh, um, in the dog. Female worms, uh, heartworms, get up to 14 inches in length, and the males get to be about seven inches. Um, keeping your dog on, on preventive medication is extremely important here in Florida. And I get it a lot. Pe people say, oh, my dog's an indoor dog. Well, even if your dog is an indoor dog, um, they go outside to go to the bathroom. They go outside to take walks. And if your dog gets heartworm, um, the cost of treatment, both financially and emotionally, is 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 excessive. It's quite high. So please be kind to your to your dogs and get them on heartworm prevention. So the one really important thing to know about all of these diseases is that there are no human vaccines. Okay, except for like yellow fever, but no human uh, uh, vaccines. There are equine vaccines for these, for the encephalitises, but no human vaccines. So control of these is through prevention and reduction of the adult female mosquito. So uh, we'll talk about why it's the female that is the important, um, the important insect in, in this case. And we'll talk about that throughout this. So mosquito culprits. So remember we're talking about container mosquitoes uh, because those are the ones we're gonna be finding in our backyard uh, and they're gonna be around standing water or temporary water sources. So Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, these two are daytime flyers, right? They're gonna be out right in the middle of the day when we're out there, right? Out working in our garden, working in our landscape. They're aggressive biters, right? They're relentless. And um, they're the ones that carry Zika and dengue and chikungunya, but aegypti also carries that yellow fever um, disease. So these guys are, are really aggressive. Then we have our Anopheles. They prefer to, to feed on humans. Remember we talked about what type of blood they like? Prefer to feed on us. They're active at dawn and dusk. So those are in those afternoon hours. Uh, as when you're going for your, your walk at night, you're taking your dog out, right? but Anopheles are the ones that carry the dog heartworm. They also carry malaria. So, right, you're out walking your dog after it's cooled down and this is when these mosquitoes are out. Then we have the Culex. These guys are active at night. Remember I talked about that witching hour? So these guys are dead of the night. When most of us are in our, you know, in bed sleeping, these guys are out. They carry West Nile virus and a few of the uh, encephalitises. So if you happen to have a horse, one, got to make sure it's, it's vaccinated. That's really, really important here in Florida. And two, if you put your horse out to pasture, leave it out to pasture at night, make sure you have some sort of mosquito protection on the horses, um, whether it's a, you know, a, a covering or you have some sort of spray that you've put on your horse. But if they're out to pasture, you know, you know, help to pr help protect them and keep them protected from, from these mosquitoes because these are the ones that are going to get them. Now, Aedes uh, aegypti and albopictus, uh, so this is a graph from 2017 just to show their distribution. Um, they're a tropical and a subtropical mosquito and they're found throughout Florida, 
They're along, along the Gulf states, all the way west to California. They can find all the way north up to the tip of Maine, which is pretty impressive. You know, they go over to Minnesota, down through uh, Missouri and Kansas, as well as part of Utah and Colorado. But as they adjust to our weather and as our weather patterns continue to shift or change, these areas of dispersal are going to continue to broaden and expand. So um, we'll see how far north and how far you know west these things are going to go. But as it warms up, these are going to be problematic, you know, probably throughout the U.S. Now, characteristics of the Aedes um, mosquito. So how do you tell an Aedes mosquito from others? Okay, I know <laughs> I'm, I'm an insect nerd, so um, I do look at the little things. So Aedes aegypti, they're small and they're dark and they have a white lyra-shaped marking on their thorax, right? So this is what we call a lyra right here, is on their thorax, right behind their head. Um, the Aedes albopictus are very similar, actually almost identical, but they have this straight line on their thorax. The nickname for this uh, mosquito is called the tiger mosquito. So I know you're probably not gonna take time to look at it um, when it's biting you before you kill it, but you know, looking for these things will tell you which one is which. And they prefer to bite ankles and elbows because these areas have really thick skin, right? There we got good calluses going on our ankles and our elbows. So thick skin and they can go undetected while they're feeding. So they, they kind of go for those areas. So um, adults stay close to home, um, less than a third of a mile. So they are truly a neighborhood mosquito. So this is really important to remember, a third of a mile. They do not venture beyond a third of a mile. Um, during the Zika outbreak in Miami-Dade County back in, what was it, uh, 2000 and, what was it, 2012, I believe? Ooh. Um, I got to look that one up when it, when it happened. But um, mosquito control only checked an eighth of a mile radius. That's only 330 feet from where a positive hit site or an infection site because of this behavior of them staying so close to home. So you don't have to go and scout the entire county if you, if you get a positive hit, you only have to check in a very small area around because that, that positive mosquito is not gonna go far. So adults feed on nectar, um, only the female needs blood to develop their eggs. So that is why the female is so important to control because she's the only one who's gonna bite you. So she's the only one that's gonna transmit disease to you. Um, they do prefer humans and then they fly and they bite and they lay eggs during the day. So that's starting about two hours after sunrise. So when we're up and, and active. Oh, forgot to click on that. So the AED's uh, life cycle. So. This is going to be a little involved, and I apologize, but it's really important to understand. So if we understand the life cycle, then we can um, use management strategies to break that cycle and get rid of these mosquitoes in our yard. So we'll start with the adult. So the female, right? Remember, it's only the female who bites. The female bites you and takes a blood meal. In about three days, so those, those eggs are gonna form, in about three days, she's gonna lay eggs just above the water line. So as you see here, it's gonna be just above the water line and she's gonna lay them in pots and containers anywhere where she finds standing water. Um, they prefer dark colored um, pots in shades because this is what their eggs look like. They look like tiny pieces of, of rice grain and they're black. So they're gonna lay eggs on something that's more dark colored because they're gonna be able to hide those eggs. Um, in a lifetime, a female can lay anywhere from one to 200 eggs per batch, and she can wear, lay five batches in her lifetime. So one female mosquito can, can lead way to over a thousand, a thousand new mosquitoes. So, these, the thing about these eggs too, they're resistant to desiccation. So they can survive for periods up to six months or more. So these eggs, what's gonna happen is they're gonna lay them above the water line. As soon as this water, as soon as this water touches the bottom of that egg, it sends off a signal to, to hatch out. So 
they can stay there from anywhere from three days to eight months before they hatch out, right? So they're, they're viable for up to eight months. So once they reach that, they're going to they're gonna open up, they're going to hatch out, and then they have these four larval stages. So this is basically, if you think about it, you know, our kids, they grow up, right? So these are the feeding stages. So they're going to be four feeding stages. They're going to feed for anywhere from three to five days. And then after that three to five days, so this is going to be a perfect scenario, right? The temperature is perfect. There's enough water for them and there's enough food source. So in three to five days, they're going to go in the, into this pupil form. So if you think about like a butterfly, right? Their pupil form is a chrysalis, right? So they're going to, it's that transformational form. The thing about mosquitoes is this is still an active form, but it is transitioning to an adult. So it's no longer a feeding stage. So this is gonna stay in this pupil phase for about three days until it becomes an adult mosquito. And it takes, in a perfect scenario, it's gonna go from an egg to an adult in as few as eight days. So that's really important, so just over a week. So when you think about it, when, when we're thinking about um, getting rid of water, standing water in our, in our, uh, around our, our homes, we want to do it within eight days. So once a week, I'm going to keep saying this, once a week, you're going to want to be checking your home, around your home, for standing water and get rid of that. Because if you dump it out, you're not going to have these mosquitoes in, in our yard and in our neighborhood. Remember, they're a neighborhood, um, they're a neighborhood um, insect, a neighborhood mosquito. And then the adults can live up to three weeks. So in that three weeks, you can give rise to over a thousand new mosquitoes. So important thing to remember, um, critical to lowering the numbers of mosquitoes in the yards and ultimately protecting yourself from bites is removing standing water. It's gonna be the first line of defense and eliminating those mosquito breeding sites. You're gonna be reducing the number of mosquitoes, right? And that's gonna protect you from, from bites. And just so you know, a tiny bottle cap size, uh, you know, when these are the top of our water bottles, that's five milli milliliters. So five mils of water is all a mosquito needs to lay its eggs and have those those uh, eggs hatch and create new mosquitoes. So when I'm talking about, you know, checking your yard for water, you're looking at even in the smallest areas. So what can you do? So walk the house. This is what I do every week. And I, and I promise I do this. Walk the house in a clockwise pattern or however you decide. Start at the front of the home and work your way around the entire house. And you're going to want to eliminate standing water or any possibility for standing water. This is going to be things like dumping out uh, recycled water holding containers, right? Anything that can hold water, a, a flower pot, um, you know, a a kid's toy, and then especially things that are dark. They're going to go to those dark things first. Get rid of old tires, um, tin cans, bottles. Remember, anything that can hold water. You know, these these old tires, um, what they started doing, well, not only do they, they harbor mosquitoes because they hold water, they also harbor um, things like, like spiders. So a good thing to do if you want these in your yard is to cut holes in it so that it drains the, that water out. Then you want to turn over larger objects like boats, kids' toys, um, planters, buckets. Remember, anything that can hold water is going to attract a mosquito. And then these are things people don't tend to think about. Tarps and tarped covered objects. Check the creases for water. A lot of people here in Florida have boats, right? You store your boat, you might put a tarp on it, and that little area that, that comes down and it just has this little indentation. If you're standing at your boat and if it's on a trailer, you don't see that, but you know that that's holding water. If it's rained or if it's you know, water, water stripped off a tree, that's gonna be holding enough water for mosquitoes. So make sure you take and, and punch that up and get that water, get that water out. So, Keep drainage areas free of trash and leaves. So there are things that we don't think about, like our, our uh, septic tanks. Those are big, uh, a, a big uh, attractive place for, for mosquitoes. And drains, our storage drains out, you know, our uh, stormwater drains out on, our, um, on the street. I have one in front of my house. I put down a mosquito dunk. We'll talk about mosquito dunks in a little bit, but these can harbor mosquitoes because there's always a bit of standing water in there. 
and make sure your gutters are free of leaves and debris. This is really important, right? I just cleaned out my gutters after that. We had a big storm a couple weeks ago and boy, I had so much tree debris in there, it was crazy. So um, this is a good time, right? We haven't started our rainy season yet, so now's a good time to clean out those, those uh, gutters. Fix your leaky faucets and your hoses so there's no standing water below it. So if that's gonna puddle below, that's gonna harbor, that's gonna be able to harbor mosquitoes. But it's also that leaky faucet, one's costing you money, and two can also attract other insects. So you're definitely gonna wanna fix those. Keeping your lid on your trash can, right? When that's turned over, it's, it's concave, it's gonna hold water and it's black. So keep that lid on that trash can and make sure you're not gonna have standing water. And this is one people don't think about either is tree holes, right? Where a limb has either fallen off or has been cut off. We get those little indentations. You can fill these, you know, before they used to fill them with concrete. But now what's a good idea is to fill them with sand so that there is no water, standing water in there. But you don't wanna completely cover that up because these tray holes are actually great resources for nurseries for other things like raccoons and other you know, birds. So you don't want to get rid of that hole. You just wanna make sure there's no way you can have standing water in it. So filling it with, with sand is a really good, a really good idea. So bird bass and bromeliad. So um, bird bass, I get asked a lot. So you're gonna want it, um, scrubbing it. Scrubbing your bird bath once a week is really important. So this removes any eggs um, when, and so when they fall on the ground, they can't hatch. So you're gonna wanna scrub it out, rinse it out. Your birds are gonna be happy for it too. And that those eggs are gonna fall on the ground. There's no water source, so they're just gonna die. Um, you can use a high power water spray uh, once, a re once a week to remove the stagnant water and, and possible, ball, uh, possible eggs, sorry. But when you're scrubbing, make sure you're getting around the water line. And you don't have to scrub hard. Um, you know, this is just, they're just tacked on there. So um, just a good light scrubbing and then, and then rinsing it out. Now, bromeliads, um, they have found that there, there are only um, three species that are known to lay eggs in bromeliad. So people say, do I take them out? Can I keep them? What do I need to do? Well, you know, that's that's for you to decide whether you want to keep them or not. I'll tell you, I have bromeliads, but I take care of my bromeliads. I think of them as having my dogs. When I walk my dogs, I don't I don't leave treats for people on their lawns. I pick it up, right? Because I'm a responsible dog owner. Well, you got to be a responsible bromeliad owner as well and maintain your bromeliad so that you're not creating a a harborage for any mosquitoes. So um, you're going to want to make sure to refresh that water weekly. So you can either, you know, blow it out with, with a high powered water spray, or you can use like a, uh, a, a backpack uh, or, or a, a, an air sprayer, uh, a leaf blower, that's what it's called, a leaf blower and blow that water out, right? So you just, you just want to, uh, change that out. You're going to want to remove any organic matter. Remember, their larvae eat organic matter. So if you remove that, that organic matter that's sitting on top, you're taking away a food source. And then you can also apply a safe larvicide, so mosquito bits. We'll talk about mosquito bits in a minute, um, but they're great, great products and they're special to mosquitoes. So they're, they're a great resource to do as well. Other thing is keeping things tidy. So keep the grass mode. So mosquitoes like to hide in shady areas, right? So, cause they, they're only out during certain times of the day and they're gonna go somewhere on those other times. So they like to be in shady areas. So keep your grass mode weekly. Um, don't let your weeds or anything get high. Trim your bushes. Mosquitoes rest in shady places. So keep your bushes trimmed back, especially away from um, door openings so that they can't make it into the house, right? A lot of people have shrubs right next, big beautiful shrubs that are right next to their, their entryways. And um, not such a great idea for, for more than mosquitoes, there's other insects, but you wanna keep those trimmed. And then repair any rips or, or tears in your screens. So this is on your lanai as well as on your, your window coverings. And then check leaf piles. Whatever can hold water will attract mosquitoes. So, you know, a lot of us have oak trees and you know how oak trees aren't flat. They have a little, you know, when they're dead, they're concave. And so what I do is I go through and I 
I um, brush my my leaf piles because I use it as mulch. I brush those to make sure I'm I'm knocking out any any water that's standing in those to make sure that there is no standing water. So getting on to the recommended five D. So mosquito management has these recommendations and you'll actually find them all, all over. So dawn and dusk, try to avoid being outdoors when the mosquitoes are biting and that's gonna be dawn and dusk, right? Those, those AADs are out during the day. Um, they're also out and then those, uh, the Anopheles are out at that, that dusk time hour. Um, dress, you wanna wear loose, light colored clothing that covers most your skin. Um, this is gonna be good for you for sun, but it's also, they're more attracted to dark, right? So you wanna wear a light colored and loose fitting means so that, you know, if you're wearing black lycra, it's not gonna matter. Um, loose fitting so that they can't pierce, right? They can't get to your skin if they do land on you. Drainage, remember, as we just talked about, checking around your home to get rid of those areas of standing water anywhere that a mosquito can lay its eggs. <clears throat> and then defend yourself. This is using um, repellents. Um, we have somebody with their mic turned on. So, so talking about repellents. So registered EPA and repellents. So registered products have an EPA registration number on the bottle. I'm not gonna go into detail on this, I just want you to know that when it has a registration number, it means that that product has been tested for both safety and effectiveness, okay? It's really important. I mean, we wanna know that it's safe, right? But we also wanna know that it's effective. There are unregistered products. These are exempt from EPA registration. Um, they, they, most of them have been tested for safety, but safety only, not effectiveness. Uh, effectiveness. They're usually natural products. So things like citronella and um, cedar oils and lavenders. Um, and so they may work, but they usually only work for a short period of time. I'm not gonna go into this rest, but just know that things that are exempt from EPA registration have only been tasted for safety and not for effectiveness. So we're gonna go over the, the, big, the big four. Um, and these are the mosquito repellents that are EPA, have EPA registration, are EPA approved, and what we recommend. Now I'm gonna start from what I wanna call the big guns, and then we'll make our way down to the squirt guns. So basically the most chemically intense and effective sunscreen to the products that are made from natural ingredients but are also effective. So the first one is DEET. So DEET and Concentrations matter. Um, so DEET in concentrations from seven to 30%. You do not want to use something on you as an adult that's any less than 7% or any more than 30, especially that, any more than 30, don't do it because this this is a, a pretty intense chemical. So you, you it, it can melt plastic. So you wanna be careful with DEET. Um, so that seven to, per, seven, seven to 30% range. It's not recommended for any sunscreen to use as a combination product of sunscreen and, and, and a mosquito repellent. People go, you know, when I was a parent, uh, young, young, when my kids were young, I should say, I thought, oh, that was the, you know, that's the next, ne next best thing because putting sunscreen and repellent on kids, you know, they, they hate it. But the problem with that is that when you think about it, you want to apply sunscreen quite often, right? You want to apply it, you know, at least once an hour. Well, it's not recommended to apply a, a mosquito repellent that often, especially something like DEET, because it lasts anywhere from eight to 10 hours. So if you're applying a product, a combination product, you're applying a lot more mosquito repellent that, than you need to expose yourself to. So put one on and then put the other and then continue to use that sunscreen, right? Every hour, but don't continue to use, if you're using DEET, don't continue to use DEET. So again, it lasts about eight to 10 hours, but it's also highly effective against ticks. Now I wanted to say that like with DEET, I would use DEET when I did use DEET when I went down to Belize, I'm walking through, you know, I'm doing hiking and I don't want to get, you know, bit by mosquitoes. But when I'm in my backyard, I'm not using DEET. So just, you know, it, it's got to be rele uh, relevant for the situation or, or pertinent to the situation. So pick your sunscreen based on what you are doing. So the next one is picaridin. So um, 
you want to get about 20 percent uh, picaridin, but you can get ones that are five to 10 percent, and it's adequate if it's reapplied. Now, the thing is, all of these I have at the end on, on a little spreadsheet for you, so so don't worry. So, picaridin, you can apply it to your clothing, um, or you can apply picaridin pre-treated clothing. I know, like um, I think it's Columbia. There's a couple of them that sell uh, uh, clothing that's impregnated with picaridin. It lasts up to eight hours, and it's considered more effective than DEET against flies. So again, pick your poison of where you're where you're going, right? So if you know you're going somewhere that has bot flies, you might want to you'd be using picaridin over using DEET. So the next one is oil of lemon eucalyptus. I love this stuff. 30% um, is good. So this is a synthesized plant oil. 30% um, concentration lasts up to six hours. So oil of lemon eucalyptus, it's, it's really effective. It's, you know, it's, it's a, a plant-based and um, it also smells really good. Now the next one is IR3535. So IR just means insect repellent. So that's what the IR stands for. And that's 10 to 20%. And that's also a synthesized plant oil. It lasts about four to eight hours. So see how we're going like we, we've got one that lasts almost all day when you're gonna be outside down to one that's gonna last most of the day, but you may need to reapply. Um, IR3535 is what we used to, what, what was found in um, uh, Avon Skin So Soft. And then there is another one, um, 2-endocanone. It's an organic compound. Um, it's synthesized, but it has a, a pretty strong order, but it, odor, but it does work really well as well. That's one of the, the newer one. So again, just saying not beneficial to, uh, to use those products in combination with sunscreen or don't do it. Um, if you're wearing long sleeve, light colored clothing, you don't need to wear repellents underneath that. You don't need to be double protective. It's okay. And then the CDC does endorse the use of EPA registered uh, products. Now here, here is that, um, that in a little spreadsheet. So if you get this, you can take and cut this out and put it on your refrigerator or, or take it and put it in your wallet. So when you go to the, to the store, you know, we can't give, we, these are all the active ingredients, right? I can't tell you to go buy off or buy Avon Skin So Soft. Um, what you need to know is the active ingredient. So this is the active ingredient, what type it is, how long it lasts, and then the recommended percent. So this is great to take with you to the store. Now, we're gonna get into things that are scientifically unproven. First thing, homemade repellent recipes, okay. You may have something that works great for you, but again, they're unproven because they only work for a very short period of time. And also, if you're making them at home, it's like any recipe, right? I make bread and it certainly doesn't turn out the way my neighbor makes bread or especially my, my pie crust never turns out. <laughs> so it's a homemade re recipe, right? If you buy those products in the store, they're going to be perfect every time. Um, but homemade repellents, um, they have limited repellency. And again, they only work for a short period of time. Now these things, bug zappers. I am not a fan of bug zappers. Of all the insects that are killed by bug zappers, only about 1% are mosquitoes. So the rest of those bugs that you're killing are non-target insects. And a large majority of those are even uh, beneficial insects. So again, I don't like bug zapper because they kill way too many insects. There are other ways to get rid of insects around your home, changing your light bulb source, you know, changing to an LED bulb, changing to yellow, yellow LED bulbs are best. So you don't need a bug zapper. So, you know, try to get rid of those if you have one. And then these, these are funny. Electronic repellents and uh, repellers and wristbands, they do very little, right? They're usually impregnated with a, a citronella or something. But as you find out, um, yeah, that's going to protect your wrist, right? You're not going to look like the you know, stay, you know, the Michelin man, right, that has got all the tires on him. That's what you would have to do for these things to actually be effective, is to put one of those around every part of your body. So other things that are unproven. So these uh, CO2 emitters, okay. Mosquitoes are attracted by many things. Um, they're attracted by our chemicals, by our breath, by our, our heat that we put off. So they do 
they are attracted to our breath. So the, that's what these CO2 emitters work off of, that they, they express uh, CO2 through this little propane tank. And so it, it attracts those mosquitoes to it and it goes into this cartridge and then you empty them out. But the thing is, you have to be within that area to attract those mosquitoes. And these things cost upward of $2,000. So they actually do little to decrease the number of mosquitoes in the area. It's gonna cost you a lot of money. And when you're putting them out, you're actually attracting mosquitoes. So um, be cautious with using these things. And then uh, things like garlic and banana and vitamins. There's no scientific evidence that says that they work, but it doesn't mean that you can't eat them you know, right? They're, they've, they've been proven to be good for other things. So what the heck? Why not? You know, eat them to, to hopefully um, see if they, they can help you with, with uh, repelling mosquitoes. And then marigolds. So back to that whole citronella and those the, 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 the smells. Mosquitoes feed on nectar, right? So the adults, okay, the female does take a blood meal, but she only takes a blood meal to produce her eggs. Both the female and the male will feed on nectar. So the flowers, if you have this beautiful flowering marigold, it's actually gonna attract marigolds. Um, and also we get a lot of these citronella oils and stuff. So things that are flowers, but when we put them in oil and we heat them, they vaporize. So if you put marigolds into, a, into an oil and vaporize it, it's gonna be effective against mosquitoes, but not as just a marigold sitting there on your, your plant while you, or on your table while you're outside. Um, Basil, however, is one of the only plants that is a true mosquito repellent. So if you're gonna to wanna to grow something to, to uh, repel mosquitoes, grow basil. So helpful to a limited degree. So mosquito repelling candles. So I kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, <clears throat> citronella oil candles are, are really popular. I actually have two outside. But what these are is when you're, you heat it up, right, it vaporizes and that goes out and that will repel. But again, that's going to be in a limited area. So, you know, you might want to put, you know, put some citronella oil in your tiki torches if you have tiki torches outside. Diffusers are also really good um, because they do the same thing, right? You put those little cartridges in and they heat up that cartridge. And that's why we get this beautiful smell but that's because it's vaporizing. So that is that is going out into the air. If you're sitting outside and you know you can have these candles, but you're still getting, getting bit, um, run an overhead fan. Okay, mosquitoes, they really are horrible at flying, right? Especially in any sort of a breeze. And remember, they go towards your ankles and your elbows. That's where they wanna bite. So if you have an overhead fan, that's going to help you with, you know, things that are up here, but you want to put a fan on a ground on the ground and aim it towards your legs, right? So you're going to stop those mosquitoes that are trying to bite you at the ankles. Also helpful to a limited degree. Okay. Attracting birds or bats. Okay. Birds and bats are fabulous. They're part of many backyard ecosystems and they're really important to that ecosystem. But mosquitoes really only make up about 1% of a bat's diet. So if you think about it, it takes a lot of energy to capture food in the air and they have to, these are small, like especially bats are small. So using up any energy is, is really costly. So if they have a choice of going for a big old moth or a little tiny mosquito, they're gonna have to eat thousands of mosquitoes to equal that one moth. So that's why the mosquitoes make up just a small part of their diet, but they're still gonna eat some mosquitoes. So build a bat house. I think they're wonderful, um, but they're, you know, they're very effective at keeping other insect populations down. So get a bat over a bug zapper any day. And then birds, you know, I have a bird feeder. Um, I don't have a bird bath, but I, my neighbor does, so. <laughs> Now, outside water sources, as we talk about bird, uh, bird baths, there are also people who have fountains. So put aerators in your bird baths or in your, your water fountain or your water feature is, is, will be very helpful because these mosquitoes like stagnant water, standing water, right? Things that aren't moving. So keeping that water moving is really important. And these aerators are gonna discourage those mosquitoes from laying eggs in that area. And then mosquito fish, <laughs> gambusia fish, they're, they're a Florida native. Um, you can get these, if you have an area, whether it's a, 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 
a rain barrel or a small area that has standing water that you can't get rid of, you can go get these mosquito fish from uh, mosquito management for free. You can put them in ponds and fountains. If you have livestock, you can put them in their, their, their water tanks and you can put them in your rain barrels. So um, they're, they're, they're fabulous. And then mosquito bits. These are another thing that um, we'll, we'll talk about. I'm just, I think my, I have a whole slide. So you have mosquito bits or mosquito dunks. Yes, here we go. Um, what these are is that they are, so the mosquito bits, these, these are pieces of corn cob that have been um, impregnated with this BTI. So it's Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. So the substrain israeliensis is specific to mosquito larvae. So what it does is you, you dump these, you can put these in, in your bromeliads, right? Or any of your, your water holding plants. Um, you, can, you can sprinkle these in uh, you know, your gutters. You can put them anywhere where you need small amounts, right? And so what this does is that BTI then slowly comes off of that. It gets in the water. If you have larvae, mosquito larvae, they eat that BTI and then basically it blows them up from the inside. So that, that bacteria then, you know, it, it propagates and then and, and kills that insect. Really, the minute it eats that, that, that BTI, it stops feeding. So, so BTI is a great thing. And again, it's specific to mosquitoes. We have mosquito dunks. These are just BTI that are impregnated. It's usually uh, um, sawdust that's been, um, you know, compacted sawdust. These have, uh, have longevities. These last longer. You can put these in your storm drains. You can put these in your rain barrels. Um, so, you know, things that you, you want them to last longer, you're going to want to use these mosquito dunks. You can also break these up too. You know, you can break them in half. You can crush them up if you, if you don't want to use the, uh, the mosquito bits. So um, rain barrels and mosquito larvae. So this is really important. You can add, add either BTI to your, to your um, rain barrels, or you can write, add your gambusia fish. You don't want to do both because that gambusia fish are eating those larvae, right? So, you know, one or the other, you, you don't want to do both. Also, um, you can add a drop of vegetable oil or any sort of an olive oil to the, to the um, water in the barrel, like if you have a rain barrel. It causes a sheen on the water. And if you, you'll see it in the next, I think I have the, the video next. Um, the way those larvae, they still breathe air. They have a little siphon that goes up and, go, and breaks that, that water air surface and they breathe air from, from, you know, from outside of the water. So when you add that oil, that drop of oil and cause a sheen, it can't, it can't get through. It clogs that siphon and it basically drowns that that mosquito larvae. So that's a really good thing you can do as well. Also placing a mesh covering um, or a netting over the top to, stopping, to stop the mosquitoes from getting into your rain barrel in the first place and laying eggs. So this is a really cool, it's just a little, uh, this is gambusia fish and um, these are mosquito larvae. So uh, here you see these larger ones. I don't know how this is looking on your saw end, but um, these are the, the pupil form, right? So these are the ones that are going to hatch out into adults. These are that the stage one to four instars, right? Those feeding stages. And as you see here, they have their siphon and they're, they're breathing air from above the water. The gambusia fish, thing about gambusia fish is they're top feeders. So if you have a pond, the you need gambusia fish because your catfish are not going to be going to the top and eating those larvae. You want a top feeding uh, fish, which are the gambusia fish. Um, so I think, oh, let me get out of that. Okay. So gambusia fish are fabulous. Um, I, I recommend them for anything. Um, you know, in any type of, whether you have a, a rain barrel, if you put them in your bird bath, of course, you know, the birds are going to have a little feast. <laughs> So community effort, so what works? So being proactive in eliminating standing water, it's a community involvement, sharing this information, right? If you don't want mosquitoes and you've done all the effort to rid them, 
you know, rid them from around your home, you've dumped out that water, but your neighbor's not doing their job, then share this. Explain to them why they need to dump out that water and be vigilant about getting rid of water. So that's going to help minimize those mosquitoes in your area. Remember, one third of a mile. So it's really important. They truly are a neighborhood mosquito. So take back your yard for mosquitoes. Get rid of that standing water and be able to enjoy, you know, being outside in Florida. So with that, this is the resources that I have. Um, and I think that's the end. And I want to say thank you.